this program was made possible by these sponsors. Welcome to your weekly program, Blahdan, the show that believes nobody has a monopoly on stupidity. We're talking about Occupy Wall Street, Occupy Minnesota, and we went there in Minnesota and we talked to the people there and when I asked them about how Tahrir Square and the Arab Spring affects Occupy Wall Street movement, and we'll show you the step later on. Uh, but today we're going to talk about what is going on in Somalia. You know, Somalia comes and back, we have a the biggest Somali community here in Minnesota, out of Magdishu, and it really it uh, affects the Somali community, the events back home. We have here a very special guest, uh, Abdel Malik Askar, and he is CEO and a founder of Somali, New Somalia, and he does training, and he, he just came back from a long trip, doing training in Dubai and elsewhere. And he lives with us in, in uh, Twin Cities. So we're going to talk about it. And uh, before we do that, also, I want to talk about this Egypt Unshackled. This is a great book, new book, talk about how the social media play a role in the uh, Egyptian uh, revolution. And this guy was there, uh, Dennis Campbell. He was there in Tahrir Square during the 18, uh, 18 months. And I decided to come here and read some of the, the email talks about what was going on in Tahrir Square during that 18 days. And then we're going to read the, some of the email here. Uh, Hunayim, over a thousand people are protesting now in Alexandria, blocking the street. And then we have Egyptian police killed Khalid Saeed and are now beating and arresting Egyptian in a mass foul. This is all just as the email goes. For me, man of year in the 2010 in Egypt is uh, the, admi the administration of Khalid Saeed page and so, well, you know, just give you a flavor of it. And so. Now back to our uh, uh, guest today, Abdel Malik Askar. Welcome to Bulahdan, and thank you for coming here. Thank you for Ahmed inviting us here today. Okay. Uh, you mean, uh, tell us a little bit about your trip. Oh, definitely. Basically, I was go to trip for work in Dubai and Doha, Qatar. And mm. basically, I trained for project management and leadership. Specifically, this uh, trip was mainly for project management, for those who want to become a certified. So we give them two weeks in Doha. Certified Kata. with what? Project management. Okay. Usually they go to the PMI, what they call Project Management Institute, give a certificate for oh, the I person see. who got to test for 200 questions. After mm. they pass, they receive that. Oh, I see. So I do training and preparing for those people. And who are those people? Uh, mainly they're from different organizations and different companies. So I was a contract in a company to hire me to do the training. Mm -hmm. And I, they organized the people. So we was 25 people and Dubai was 21 people. You know, the, the Somali, uh, Somalia is back in the news with right. this uh, so-called uh, suicide bomber in mm -hmm. Mogadishu that Definitely. killed young uh, students. students. Mm -hmm. What's the latest on that? And it definitely, you know, Mogadishu was a sad story for students who preparing to take a test. They did the test, but they're waiting for the result. Mm -hmm. And uh, this they is the one I go to Turkey, Turkey, to work the capital to city study, for study. the students, yeah, uh, universities. Yes. 
and the Turkey helping for the famine, and then also they said we need to help them for the students I see. from Somalia to Turkey, and they pledged for 500 students for the university capacities. Wow. So they divided all in Somalia, not only in Magadisha, but also in Pantalan and Somaliland, and also Galmudik. So the students the, in Mogadishu, they will detect the test, and they're looking for the result. And what happened is they bring it a big car truck, put in a diesel, big pearl, and they put it on a palm, and the front of the gate they hit in the suicide. So, so who did that? Uh, Al Shabab claimed those. They so claim it and they said we did it right away. Before that, in the last year, they also graduation students, they suicide that. And uh, they, but they did not claim right away that mm -hmm. three days later they said yes. But first time they said no. But this one, we don't know why. After 10 minutes, they said we did it. And what is the political motivation for uh, hitting people who want to go to Turkey? Political motivation to go to Turkey? Well, what, what they are gaining out of this, the, the Shabab? For the Al Shabab? Yeah. Now, Al Shabab, they said that if you want to close to the governments or the places to the government, is that's the punishment we do for the people. Oh, I see. So they want people to abandon. So they, yeah, and then and then some people they ask them and say why you did it in that place, not other places. They said this is easy target. Oh, I see. And that is why they they take the opportunity. So did, did you visit Somalia at all? In this no, I didn't trip? visit Somalia. Okay, you know yeah. all this. You're very close to Somalia. Absolutely, I met a lot so you, of people. So you have a lot of Somalia that live there. And, yeah, absolutely. And, uh, so what, what, the are, what are they saying? The Somalis, they talking about nowadays, because as you know that in Al Shabaab, since they did that, now they're moving for Mogadishu. But it's, that's not guaranteed. Sometimes they can go back any time. Because Al Shabaab are not different than the people. Mm -hmm. They're the same people. They're just mm -hmm. only wearing the shorts, it changed. <laughs> they cover the face, they take out the face. Yeah. <laughs> and you so it could know, be anybody. Yes, it could be anybody in Mogadishu. So, you, so you're never expecting that some people from different yeah. places. So in Al Shabaab now, the people worry about the, the area that doesn't have more security. They can easily target. And they don't have now a capacity to control all Mogadishu or to fight face-to-face -face military, but only they can do for suicide. Mm. So maybe now people worry about the buses, the restaurants, the gathering places is the most you know, dangerous about the people talking about. And the government is now expanding in a Mogadishu. Also, that is a risk also so because they cannot control whole Mogadishu. The government <laughs> is a very weak government. So when you talk the government, mm -hmm. who is the government? The government is the transitional federal government. They're not full government, but they're temporary governments. Yeah, and they have now in one year, uh, after one year they got 2012, they go to the election, if it's possible, because mm -hmm. Africans, they can say no any yeah, time. Yeah. Uh, and, th and that is, and they have uh, 10,000 troops from different African countries, Uganda, Prondis, and mainly they focus in, in Mogadishu, especially in the airport and the ports, so mm -hmm. they, sometimes they don't care about far away from Mogadishu. Tell me a little bit about Soma New Somalia. Uh, you founded the organization here. Right. So, so you're talking about mm -hmm. uh, New Somalia here or you want New Somalia there? W what happened is after we saw the famine for Somalia and the media and all attention is group of Somalis, including me, we come together and said how we can help them, how we can participate to help this. Mm -hmm. And then we said, first of all, who we are. Mm -hmm. Are we all the generation, young generation? Because I was the member of this, the first group coming to Minnesota, and we started the life in Minnesota, in Marshall, Minnesota, mm -hmm. to all the way down to Minneapolis. And our purpose- You lived in Marshall, Minnesota? Marshall, Minnesota. Wow. In 1992. And our purpose to come to Minnesota that time was, we come from San Diego. We come to here to buy a car, to walk a hard, to buy a car, and go back to San Diego. Oh, really? <laughs> so since now, we didn't go back. We're still in Minnesota. <laughs> the car didn't make. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so, so, the, so the people come. At that time, we are 48 people uh, from Greyhound Bus to all the way down to Marshall, oh. Minnesota. Uh -huh. And that is what we explore. We don't know anybody in Minnesota. Oh, really? Yes, and we are very young at that time. So why Marshall? In Marshall, there were two Somali Kenyan. Uh, they got a scholarship from. Oh, I see. They got a scholarship from Southwest State University, and they live in Marshall, Minnesota. And they said, "Guys, you can get a work here for six dollars thirty-five cents, 
and uh, you can work for 14 hours, 17 hours. Mm -hmm. In San Diego, it was $4 and a quarter, and we work eight hours, but at the same time, we get bus for seven hours. <laughs> so they said that seven hours, you can work overtime here. <laughs> it's more pay. It's a math thing. So you can guys get a buy, a, <laughs> collect the money, buy a car, and go back to San Diego. <laughs> So they persuade wow. us that way, and we and said, okay, let's explore. But they said, bad news is, uh -huh. it's, it's snow. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and we never saw the snow. Uh -huh. So we, we get a great home bus, and we come to Colorado, the first is snow. Yeah, and, <laughs> and that was the winter time? Winter time oh, really? in, in 1992, and then all the way down to Marshall, Minnesota. And that's probably the story of most of the immigrants, Somali in particular. In particular, yeah. Somalis, yeah, I saw a lot of non-profit organizations when they spoke, they, they organized, they said, we come here for a job mm -hmm. and this and this, but through the story, that's the fact. Mm -hmm. When we come to Minnesota, we come to buy a car and go back, <laughs> Yeah. but we're still stuck here. Well, that's lucky for us to right. have you. Right, so, so our group, we discussed it and said who we are first, and then we said, maybe we, we, let's start it for the new face in Somalia, mm -hmm. new generation, because majority at that time of the group, like say my age, uh, I was left to the 17 years old. And we said, I live here now 18 years, so we half and half. So, <laughs> and also that time there was no Facebook, there was no YouTube in Somalia yeah. at the time we left it, but now we do have. So let's create a new Somalia who can work both of them, if we possible try, mm -hmm. because our dads and mothers are still in Minnesota, mm -hmm. and some of them back home. But some like me, luckily they are here. So we decided then to create an organization, very simple, very easy, called Ni Somalia. And we said what we can do about, for those who need the famine and support, it's only temporary, but long term, they need the people education mainly. Mm -hmm. and, and we're focusing about the education to training about the people. And that's the most valuable things, yeah. to train the people, because you cannot always feed the people. Yeah. So the organization, they can raise money, and they can go there, and they can get a food, feed and then they left us. it. Yeah. But what for us, it's different. We would like to create more jobs to, to about the training. The same mm. I did it now, my job, to go to Dubai and train project management, to go back in Somalia and train project management and train in the leadership courses. Mm. So we started that in the new Somali organization, and we sit down with the mayor of Minneapolis. He supported us, and our, also the St. Paul, Chris Coleman, supported us. Mm. And now we move on to the other area. So we're not rush to buy food and send it, we didn't go that way. We mm -hmm. said, let's go to the different way and try to do the trainings. So we're organizing now who we're gonna partner with. And the purpose I'm here today to ask all the Minnesotan about to volunteer or to help us to be a partner, mm -hmm. to help the Somali about the education and about the leadership. You, you know, the, the food security yeah. issue and the occurrence of this famine, you know, yeah. it just keep on, uh, so it must be a structural problem. What do you think there is that keeps on uh, bringing famine back? The problem, first of all, is number one is the safety. Mm -hmm. And uh, number two is a lack of uh, trust. Uh, sometimes the organization is, uh, you might see also there is uh, some corruption is there. Mm -hmm. Because of the long distance of the people, uh, who is going to go to inside Somalia, the people, they want to stay in, in the capital city, Nairobi. So they put in a truck, the loads, and, and go to the food over there. And the distribution also is not organized sometimes. So if you, if you donate, it, the people, they donate $10,000, maybe they get over there for $200, $300. Mm -hmm. It's because it's the percentage about that, especially yeah, so for the big organization. It doesn't like, go directly to the needy. Not directly, exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, but that way to change, it takes time. Mm -hmm. And also it needs like a lot of people to go back and, and work with their, that way they can get support. Uh, you know the, a lot of Somali uh, expatriates, they send money home, mm -hmm. remittance and all that. Right. But the issue of war on terrorism and patriotic act and all that, mm -hmm. preventing uh, some of this goodwill uh, mm -hmm. to, 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 to reach uh, the Somali that they needed. And then we have last week or so that uh, the arrest of a, a woman or two women in the Somali community mm -hmm. been accused of helping uh, uh, Al-Shabaab or sending them money. Mm -hmm. my, my, my thinking is, and that the, the fiasco about not standing uh, during uh, the trial, and, it, and I, I, the media goes and making a, a, a theoretical uh, and a circus out of this. Mm -hmm. uh, 
I mean, uh, next time, I mean, uh, if somebody not standing during the, the national anthem at the baseball game, uh, might be arrested. You know, it's just something, but, you know, divert from the main issue. Mm -hmm. So is it a clear cut? Do people know when they send money to your family? And they send money to my family. I don't know what they do with it. Uh, in, in the beginning, there was people sending money. You send to your cousin or your sister. Yeah. But at that time, there was not organized. But nowadays, mm -hmm. uh, if you go to the Hawala with a money wire in Somali malls, uh, you put your driver license, they take your driver license, and then you send the money. So they know where you send the money and who send the money. Mm -hmm. But before, there was no truck. Well, the Hawala also was under uh, suspicious. Before years, but yeah. nowadays the hawala and everything is they clear. But yeah. maybe for those women, is they may go back earlier and they say when they buy, the, ask them where they send it, who they send it. Mm -hmm. But if you send it now money, go to the hawala. If you're not in their database, they ask you your driver license. Give him the driver license. They take your driver license. But and you know you how, send the money. how our community works. We don't trust. Uh, institution and organization and all that we like to send money directly or walk with it and all that informal way of doing business you know I but this is a formal now yeah. this is formal now before there was not registry there was not somehow well as not member of the department of businesses but now everything is as clear and everything is if you go to the somali mall is in any hawala they register it. They have is the Hawala is just one in organization or the or, no, or the have process? No, they different businesses. Hawala is a different business. I understand, from but, but uh, do people trust this? Uh, For the Somalis yeah. or the Americans? Somalis. The Hawala? Yeah. What's the relationship between Hawala and the Somali community? Why would somebody resort to someone else when there is an access to Hawala, which is legit and clear yourself and all that? And they try to send it with a friend or relative or take it himself or herself. No, basically, the question is why we need Hawala in the first place. The Hawala, what we need is, is because if you go to the money wire or money gram, they're not sending it in Mogadishu. No. So the Hawala is there in Mogadishu. Yeah. So that is why basically they have access well, to go they, to Mogadishu. They offer a service that, that the other people cannot do that. Of course. That's number one. The yeah. secondly is how you organize those. Mm -hmm. So the government, what they did is they register it and they said, Everybody who's sending the money, we need to know. If later we can ask you that. And then they said, everybody who's sending the money, we need your driver license. Because everybody has a driver license. Yeah. So everybody give him driver license. You put it, also they put it even electronic. So they swap your card for the driver license. And it's copy there. And so there's no issue nowadays in mm -hmm. Hawala. But before, yes, they might say that we suspected this, we suspected that, they send it that, we say that. But now I don't, I don't think so that's a problem. Well, Abdul Malik Askar, CEO and founder of uh, uh, Soma New Somalia, and uh, you know, training, uh, leadership uh, that they can go and help uh, Somalia uh, on the long term. And uh, uh, we'd like to thank you for coming here. We appreciate you coming. Good luck with your foundation. And thank you uh, so much. And, and they can go to the website for the newsomalia.com. Yeah, newsomalia.com, and then go check uh, all the information you need. But before we do that, and I was talking about uh, occupy Minnesota and 10 months after the Arab Spring, now the Americans are waking up to revolt against uh, corporate jihadists and, finan uh, and Wall Street uh, uh, you know, extremists. And uh, we see them claiming and occupying public places. Uh, Wall Street uh, and all major cities, there are thousands of people going to public places, occupying it and making a statement about well, you know, the 99%, the, the silent majority, those people who are been screwed by the 1%, the top. So I went to uh, downtown Minneapolis to occupy Minnesota and talk to the people. And ma my main issue was uh, how the Arab Spring affects the Occupy Wall Street movement. And here is the tape. See you next week. And salam alaikum and God bless you all. Do I think the Arab revolu Revolution is affecting things in Wall Street? Yeah, uh, the organizers of uh, Occupy Wall Street have admitted that they were inspired by the revolutions in Tunisia and in Egypt. Um, 
And you can tell by the tactics. The tactics they are using are very similar to the tactics that uh, were being used, especially in Cairo. Uh, renaming, taking over spaces, central spaces in cities, and renaming them for the people, for liberation. I can't speak. How the Arab Spring affecting the American Spring movement? Like the Arab Spring did, because uh, I think we definitely need some serious change in this country here. Yeah, well, they taught us a very good lesson, didn't they? I mean, they went out and risked their lives. I'm not sure, I guess. I hope that... Americans will see that other people are on the same page and... I think uh, we need to wake up in America. We've been ripped off every day, so... Oh, inspiration, my friend, inspiration! <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. It might be, because it, could, it probably inspired the American people. That we all are going to have to wake up one way or other. Like it or not, we're all going to wake up. I think the whole world is waking up. This isn't like just something happening in this country. It's happening everywhere. I, I think that the thing that happened in Wisconsin earlier this year was a direct result of e Tunisia and Egypt. The thing is going worldwide. No, I mean... Uh, no for Arab Spring, but Arab Tattoo, it's, maybe. It's it's just to, um, actually the tattoo artist who does it likes to do uh, Arabic work. Oh, of course. It was a huge inspiration. I mean, I, I think that honestly, this is a, it's a worldwide, it's a worldwide movement. And I think that a lot of people, you know, base it on what did happen over in Egypt because it's... Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, when people rise up, when there's oppression, when, uh, when there's... When there's an autocracy going on, when there is uh, a small group of people, an oligarchy that's taking things over and running it, the people won't put up with that for very long. So the Arab Spring has worked pretty well. I don't know. It might have been in some inspiring. Uh, I think it's a huge role uh, that the Arab Spring has, play has played. I think the events of January 25th in Tahrir Square uh, really have, they shook America. As I'm standing at People Plaza in downtown Minneapolis, I saw a lot of things that remind me of Tahrir Square in Cairo, Egypt. The cross, the friendly faces, the hospitality. That was Occupy Minnesota. I went there last Friday and I talked to the people there. And it's amazing how the similarity between uh, People Plaza in downtown Minneapolis and Tahrir Square. Of course, the scale is not there. Tahrir Square has three million, five million people at the uh, last day when Mubarak steps down. Uh, that was at the time probably a thousand max at the end of the day. But the people, the signs, uh, you know, the similarity is there and the demands. And, you know, the Arab Spring is about toppling corrupt politicians and regimes. Uh, the American uh, Spring was about toppling corrupt uh, Wall Street and financial jihadists and uh, and the abusive uh, our, the abusive system of our our financial economic system. You know, many, one of one of the moment really that captured the moment of the Harris Square and really shook me apart is when uh, when an, uh, a helicopter was hovering on the top of the the crowds and. Uh, and uh, nobody paid attention to it, but uh, the analogy of those jets that Mubarak sent to scare the, the people at Tahrir Square, break the sound barrier, and people in Tahrir Square start chanting millions, five million people, uh, you know, people 
start ch chanting uh, uh, Husni went crazy. Husni, that's his first name, or Muhammad Husni Mubarak, that's Mubarak. Husni Gannin, Husni Gannin, uh, Mubarak went uh, mad. Uh, and, and Mubarak at that moment, no, there was no going back. Uh, those Egyptians broke the uh, fear barrier. And I think uh, uh, Occupy Wall Street is going to that direction. And I think as, as Gandhi once, again, uh, once said, they ignore you. First, they ignore you. Second, they ridiculate you. Third, they fight you. And then you win. And then this is what's happening in, uh, in the movement of uh, Wall Street, uh, Occupy Wall Street, and uh, how this is picking momentum and people gathering from all wax, uh, walks of life. And what, I, what, what really is interesting that the Tea Party that is anti big and anti spending and anti, uh, no place to be found. And, and those are the ones uh, who, who really took American. Uh, by surprise in the last uh, year or so, uh, anti-government, anti-tax, anti-spending, anti-anti, but when it comes to uh, Wall Street and corporations, uh, they give them a pass. And uh, so uh, hopefully uh, Arab Spring will play a, mi a minor, even minor role in picking up the American Spring. And we toppled, the Arab Spring toppled uh, the general, military generals, uh, uh, and I think the Arab, uh, the American Spring will double the financial general, General Electric, General Motors, General Dynamic, and all those generals. So be there. See you next week, and God bless you all.